Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker this evening, the Bishop of Rhode Island, the Right Reverend Nicholas Nice, who is both a... Does someone have a question in the back? Oh, just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> How do you spell that? <laughs> he is a professor, both in the classroom and in the pulpit, which qualifies him eminently to speak on this evening's topic, science and religion. Can there be a conversation? We are very glad to have welcomed him to the diocese uh, to become our bishop this past November, uh, where he was formerly the dean of Trinity Cathedral in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I think that's... What is needed by introduction, I'm very glad to have someone who is becoming a friend of mine, a friend to this congregation, and a friend to the people of Rhode Island, Bishop Nicholas Nisley. Thank you. Welcome. You want to turn that off? It's like it's Easter or Christmas around here. This is great. <laughs> Um, I, I thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for coming out. It's, I, I'm very honored, uh, and I hope this is worth your time. And if it's not, well, we'll refund your purchase price <laughs> on the way out. I think there's this kind of interest in the topic of science and religion because, frankly, most of the controversy right now in American society, if you think about it for a moment, is based in distinctions where science says one thing and religion says another thing. What's the meaning of the beginning of life? When does life start? And many religious voices say one thing and many scientific voices say another thing. How do we sort of deal with these competing claims? What does it mean to be male or female? What does gender mean? And there are traditional answers about gender Scientific ideas are evolving and gender is not seen as a binary thing but as a spectrum and that creates con conflict and sort of competing worldviews. How old is the earth? How old is the universe? A lot of biblical voices will say, well, we read the Bible that the earth is young, maybe five or six thousand years old. And a lot of scientific voices say, well, you know, there's this basalt stuff, and it seems to be about four and a half, four point seven billion years old, and the universe looks like it's, uh, what's the last number I've heard, about 14, 14.1 billion years old or so. Depends how you understand the uh, ultraviolet results from Kobe down in Antarctica. Um, and that's all changing all the time. I, I try to keep up with it, but I can't always. And I think people want to talk about how these two worldviews can talk with one another. And they're usually set up as kind of a clash of paradigms, that the two speak against each other and, and can't speak to each other. And I think some of that speaking against each other is sort of built in to the way they work. And I want to suggest towards the end of the talk about some places where I think they ought to talk and I want to tell you why I think it's so important that these two worldviews find a way to talk. I've given this talk before, obviously, uh, and lots of people have asked me about this over the years. I kind of feel like a talking dog in this thing. It, it's kind of... No one really remembers how well the dog talked or the grammar the dog had. They just think it's kind of neat that a dog can talk. <laughs> dogs aren't supposed to talk. And religious people aren't supposed to be scientific and scientific people aren't supposed to be religious. Um, I, I should say, it, somewhere it was said that I'm a, I was a professor of physics and astronomy at Lehigh. I wish I had earned that title of professor. I was not. I was an adjunct. And the deal was they needed someone to teach physics and astronomy in the afternoon and I had some spare time and I could take the money they were giving me and I could use it to hire a youth group leader for the congregation I was leading and use some of the extra money to do some work I was doing in Swaziland with AIDS hospice program. So it seemed like a wonderful deal. But I said to the department, I'm only going to do it if you let me teach in my clericals because I don't want to have to go home and change into my physics uniform, which is khakis and a button-down shirt and a lot of chalk stains, uh, and then come back to the church and change back into my black clericals. And I said, well, that'll probably be okay. It was quite a disturbance on campus. 
when I walked across campus in my black clericals and walked into the physics department and into the big lecture hall and took the chalk and stood up in front of the class. And for the first few years, people were really sort of discombobulated by the idea that, that I could do that. And people wanted to know how I did it. And people were kind of curious how I got to where I got to. I would love to tell you that my studies of physics led me to some deep religious insight. Uh, it didn't. <laughs> I was finishing up my doctorate at the University of Delaware. I had, my master's was in uh, quantum mechanics inside black holes, solutions to the Klein-Gordon equation in de Sitter space. Uh, which no one cares about, but I spent about three years with a lot of paper and pencil working out equations. And my PhD work was on liquid crystal phase transitions uh, near a Landau point, which is impressive if you know something about solid state physics. But I was always kind of annoyed because everyone else in the physics department loved what they were doing. And I was kind of doing it because I couldn't think of anything else to do with my life. I'm just one of those people that physics and math comes relatively easily to. Uh, it's not something I had to really struggle with in a lot of ways. I, I forced myself to get through my studies, but I was always kind of annoyed by how much my classmates loved what they were doing. And I always had my nose in a science fiction novel, or I was reading philosophy, or doing something else entirely different. My wife and I were graduate students at the University of Delaware. She finished her studies, got a job where she worked there happened to be a lovely little colonial Episcopal church. She told me one Easter she wanted to go to church there. I said, sure. We went to church there. The next week we thought it was a nice place. We went back. They said, oh, you have a lovely voice. You need to be in the choir. The next week I was in the choir. Um, and it was a done deal from there. I began to get involved in outreach ministry, working with street people. I worked with a group of Franciscan brothers in Wilmington who were feeding the poor. I got so excited by what I was seeing happen when I was working with street people that I began to question if I had this much passion about working with the poor and I don't have it in physics then maybe I'm in the wrong field and I had a lot of time to talk to God about that and after some conversations with my wife she said I could explore that I went to see the bishop and he said okay <laughs> and here I am uh, <laughs> 20 some odd years later it, it really has been a conversation between science and religion that I've had in my own life because I didn't go in a linear way from one to the other. They were two parallel tracks and perhaps that informs the way I understand them. I remember in seminary once a professor of mine asking me as I just finished my PhD studies and was there, he said, so uh, Nick, what do you think, science and religion? I said, you know, I don't know. It's like I had the science part of my brain and this religion part of my brain. And when I'm in the religion part of my brain, everything makes sense there. And when I'm in the science part of my brain, everything makes sense there. And they don't really talk too much to each other. And he looks sort of sad. And he said to me, you know, if you ever figure out how to get those two parts to talk together, you might have something to say to us. And I remembered that. And I always was sort of waiting to see when that moment would happen, when there'd be that integration. And I realized it happened when I was teaching at Lehigh. The church I was serving was on one end of what's called the Penny Bridge, because it used to be a penny toll to go across it. And the University, Lehigh, is on the other side. And it's about a three-minute drive from one side of the river to the other. But in that three minutes, I remember I used to feel my brain switching from my scientific brain to my religious brain and back and forth. And it was kind of a mental whiplash. It really was because I put on a different way of thinking and a different set of paradigms, a different way of understanding the world. I did that for about six years. And I noticed towards the end of the time that I was teaching that I didn't experience the whiplash. What I was doing in the classroom and teaching, and it was mostly philosophy of, of physics at that point, what I was teaching was beginning to inform my preaching. And what I was thinking about theology and the meaning of life was beginning to inform what I was talking about in the lecture hall. And I realized I had sort of by default found a way to integrate the two in my own life. I started a blog called Entangled States. 
And quantum entanglement is one of those weird things that you can only explain with quantum physics, can't be explained with uh, classical physics, and I think that's really important for us, especially in religion, because so much of religious thought comes out of the classical Enlightenment period, especially for those of us who are descendants of the Reformation. And I wanted to point out that there may be a new paradigm emerging. Uh, and after blogging for a while on all kinds of things, I found that I was most interested in talking about science and religion. So there's been a bunch of posts up there. I've been working on a book that should be coming out any day now. It's at the publisher, and we're waiting for that. And I'm in a lot of trouble with the National Church again. Uh, they've asked me to write a book on science and religious meditations for next Lent for the Episcopal Church. And I'm about two-thirds of the way through that. And my publisher keeps calling to say, when is it going to be done? When is it going to be done? When the crises stop here and I can get on with other things. So how do we begin this conversation between science and religion? I think to begin with, we have to admit that we have a challenge. This is not an easy thing to manage. If it was easy, we'd all be walking around and we wouldn't be fighting in society about these kinds of paradigm clashes that we are. And part of it has to do with the fact that scientific thought and religious thought have different ways of ascertaining what is true. Think about that for a second. You kind of know the scientific method, and I'll review it here, but what's the religious method? How do we know a religious idea is true? The sources of religious ideas are primarily revelation. Those of us who are in the Abrahamic faith traditions Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all believe that God spoke in some definitive way through prophetic utterances. Those have been collected over time and put into a library of books that we call the Bible, Torah, Talmud, Quran, and that somehow those contain utterances that we have to take seriously and privilege over other kinds of information. We think of things in religion by analogy. If it's this, then we, you know, the, the classic example is we see the butterfly, the, uh, the larva goes into a pupa, a chrysalis space, and emerges as a butterfly. Joseph Butler, the Bishop of Durham in the latter part of the 18th century, wrote a whole book on that idea. It was a tour de force in, in Europe for a while, and now everyone's forgotten him entirely. Poor Bishop Butler. Uh, I have no illusions of my own lasting power. And that becomes an analogy to resurrection. And so we, that's kind of how natural theology works. We look to see what we can see in the natural world and we try to make inferences or draw analogies to what we see in the spiritual world. And then there's this idea of group ascent, that a community of people come to a common mind. And Christianity talks about that's the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Other people have different kinds of ideas. You have communities, communes that kind of group ascent. Here's a really interesting question, and I don't know that I have the answer to it yet, but I've been thinking about it an awful lot. How do we know or decide something is true in a religious way? If we have two groups that are claiming to have religious truth, how do we discriminate between two truth claims, between religious bodies? How do you make a decision, well, that's the truth I accept, and that's the truth I reject? And the best answer I've been able to come up with for the moment is that we tend to test things. In, in Greek orthodoxy, they talk about the reception of the faithful. If the bishops promulgate a new doctrine in Greek orthodoxy, it's taught to the people, and they wait to see if the people of God receive the doctrine and say, yes, we hear the Holy Spirit in that idea. And, and they reflect it back. And that may take centuries. They use the, the reception of the Nicene Creed is a kind of classic example. It was written, and it took about two or three hundred years before it was kind of broadly accepted throughout the whole of the church. But there was the ascent of the faithful. People in Protestantism will often argue that we want to go back to what the early church did because we see that that's an idea that has been successful over a long period of time. Um, if you're into semiotics, you could say that it's a meme that has been able to withstand various challenges, and it's propagated forward in time, and it's become a successful meme that has changed the way we view the world around us. 
you can just say, if you want to use evolutionary language, we've come to a way of thinking that has been able to withstand many challenges, and survival of the fittest in, the, in sort of the, the intellectual realm. But something is true of it. We test an idea, we see if it bears fruit. I think Jesus says that good trees bear good fruit and bad trees bear bad fruit. So we tend to wait to see what the fruit is going to look like. And, and I think that's an important tool for us to decide whether or not something is true if we have two groups making claims. It means we have to be patient, we have to wait, um, and we may be generations till we know the answer to an important question. How does science make decisions? Well, science is based on observation. It's based on explanation. You make observations, you test out your ideas, by trying to explain what you're observing, and then in the best of all possible worlds, you make a prediction about what's going to happen. And that prediction is testable. You ever hear of Karl Popper? Karl Popper was a great sort of theorist about scientific philosophy. Popper says scientific statements are falsifiable. That you can make a statement that can be tested. And that's when you know you're doing science. If you're saying, you know, people say, well, what about ghosts? Can science test it? Well, you have to come up with an experiment to test a ghost before it's properly in the realm of science, according to Popper. Popper is pretty popular among scientists these days, so it's worth taking him. How do you determine truth in science? Well, there's one referee, and I'll tell you how this came to be in a little bit, but there's one referee in science, and that referee is the lab bench. You can have whatever theory you want. I can have this wonderful model of how semi, uh, uh, elementary particles work, and this person can have a wonderful model of how elementary particles work, but you have to make a prediction. And once you make a prediction, the experimentalists go to work on it, and once it's verified, you win. That was the whole sort of exciting thing about the God particle, the Higgs. That's a stupid name. Physicists hate it. Theologians hate it. Uh, it was a quip. Somebody said they were talking about the success of the standard model in particle physics, and they were talking about the search for the way that mass, our sense of inertia, is connected to space, time, electricity, magnetism, everything else. And this physicist named Higgs had said, well, there could be this particle. And he kind of described how it behaved. And someone said, boy, if we could find that, it'd be like the God particle, because we'd, we'd have solved everything in the standard model. So it got called the God particle. Everyone looks for it. It has nothing to do with God at all. But it was a prediction, and it was verified. And so it became science. Right? And, and now we have to deal with the fact that that scientific model is really useful. It has horrible problems that we don't know how to solve, but it works really, really well for certain things. You know, like the electron, silly electrons. Um, they're supposed to be charged particles, but if you look carefully at an electron, we've never been able to measure a radius on an electron, which means you have zero radius. Well, if you have zero radius and you have a finite charge, you do the math. You, you remember, you can't divide by zero. Think, bad things happen to your math. Electrons can't exist, but they do, and we don't know why. So we kind of wave our hands and say, well, it works pretty well, and we'll just sort of move on from there. Um, there's a lot of stuff like that in modern science. So how does this play itself out? And I just want to talk a little about the scientific method, because I think most of us are familiar with it. Uh, the motion of the planets can be explained in a number of ways, and this is a pretty standard way of talking about things. Uh, the question is, which way we describe the motion of the planet that is most satisfying to an individual is going to be the one that people accept. And I'm going to tell you that I'm going to recapitulate how Ptolemy, it was about 200, B, 200 AD or so, worked out the motion of the planets, and how Copernicus, what's that, about 1300 or so, worked out the motion of the planets. And then I'm going to allude to the fact that Einstein comes along in the 20th century and says, well, actually, Ptolemy has a pretty good argument. I know, isn't that weird? Einstein does all that kind of stuff. So some background, just to show you how this works. Uh, we know planets tend to move across the sky from west to east over long time. So planets, the, the word means wandering star, 
planets, which way is east here? That way? That way. So planets rise in the east overnight and they travel and they set in the west. But if you go out every night and you look at where the planet is against the stars, you'll see that the planet is slowly traveling in the other direction. So it moves its way slowly across the sky. It's a wandering star. But every now and then, some of the planets, not all the planets, um, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the uh, naked eye planets to do this, they, they like stop moving. And then they begin to move the other direction, east to west. And it's very slow, and then they stop, and then they move back the other direction. That's called retrograde motion. We've known about retrograde motion for a very long time. Uh, when Matthew talks about the Star of Bethlehem, I have a whole other lecture on the Star of Bethlehem. Have you back at Christmas time? We'll do that one. <laughs> when Matthew talks about the Star of Bethlehem in the Bible, now Matthew's never meant a miracle he's not going to point at. Right? He, he's really excited when a miraculous thing happens because that fulfills a prophecy. But when he talks about the star that the Magi are following, he never says, that's a miracle. He talks about it and he even uses the Greek word for retrograde. And we translate, and the star stopped and then went ahead of the wise men to Bethlehem. It, it's actually in Greek, the star actually goes retrograde for a while while they're on their way to Bethlehem. Which indicates that this is something else going on here. But that's a digression. <laughs> Come back in, in Christmas time and I'll do that one. So how do you describe this backwards behavior? All right, so Ptolemy. Ptolemy was uh, one of the librarians at the uh, Library of Alexandria. And you got to kind of remember that predicting where the planets were in the sky was a big deal. It was military technology. Because people believe that what happened in the heavens influenced what happened on the earth. And you needed to attack the enemy at a time when the planets were favorable to your efforts. So you needed to know where the planets were going to be to do the attack. And so they spent a lot of money on this thing. It, you know, it was pretty serious importance. It's why it was a capital crime to know the birth time of an emperor of Rome. Because if you knew the birth time of the emperor of Rome, then you could make the horoscope of the emperor of Rome and you'd know when a good time would be to you know, go Caesar on him or whatever. Um, and and that, it really was a state secret. So Ptolemy comes along and he says, I need to figure out a way to predict where the planets are. And he uses Aristotelian logic. Aristotle had this idea that the heavens were the place of perfection. It starts with Plato and Aristotle plays with it. Um, the heavens are perfect. There's perfection above and imperfection below. So we, we kind of get the idea we want to focus on what's heavenly. We don't want to focus on what's earthly. That you see that sometimes in other kinds of thought as well. And circles are perfect. So therefore, anything that's in the sky must be moving in a circular path. This, this, is, this shows up in Christianity, by the way. Is it, um, oh, who's the geometer? Uh, maybe it's Dionysius the Areopagite. Um, Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. The real Dionysius the Areopagite. It's a Greek guy. He said that when we are in heaven, we have spherical bodies. Because we have perfect bodies in heaven, right? And the only perfect shape would be a perfect sphere. So. This idea informs Christian theology as well. I know, it'd be great. You don't have to worry. It would all look exactly the same. <laughs> but because only circles are found in heaven, then you have to figure out a way to make the planetary motion be described by perfect circles. And if the planets are going backwards every now and then, you can't do that with a simple circle. And so Ptolemy's big insight was, I'll use a couple of circles. So he took one circle, he kind of offset it a little bit. That's great. That's a moment of freedom if you're doing the math. That gives you a, a parameter you can adjust so you can make your, your, data fit your, or your theory fit your data. And then he took another circle and he called it an epicycle. And he had that go around the circumference of the circle so that what you get is kind of this loop-de-loop -loop motion as you go around. And if you're in the center, what you're going to see is things are going backwards every now and then. They're mostly moving one direction, but they're going to move backwards every now and then. Um, and you can adjust the speed of the loop. You can adjust the size of the radius of the epicycle. And it gives you a lot of things you can adjust, and that's great. If you give me all that kind of adjustment stuff, I can do a pretty good job of fitting my theory to the data. 
And, and Ptolemy did. He, he thought he was describing what he really saw, but in fact, he was coming up with a really clever calculation tool for figuring out how the planets are moving. Uh, and the rest of this is just calculation. So he does the calculation, publishes tables. They work really well for about a thousand years. They start to fall apart. Uh, and they redo them, the Alphonsine tables. They do those again. And then they don't really work too well. And uh, one of my absolute favorite characters in science, Tycho Brahe, uh, who is the world's greatest naked eye astronomer, uh, he, saw, he was able to do things without telescopes that no one has ever been able to duplicate. Tycho Brahe made these brilliant calculations and he hired this guy Kepler to work with them to figure it out and they began to, began to see that things were a little more complicated. But on the way to that, there was this guy Nicholas Copernicus. He was a professor of astronomy at Jangelian University in Krakow. He was also an ordained uh, Catholic clergy person. I think he was a deacon. Though he might have, he might be a priest. I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. I got a chance to go to Krakow once, and I, that was the thing I wanted to see most was Copernicus lecture hall. And they still have some of Copernicus' tools. I mean, it's just brilliant chance. If you ever get a chance to go to Krakow, stop. Copernicus comes along and he says, "You know what? The trouble is that to fix all these mistakes, what they ended up doing is they put epicycles on epicycles on epicycles." So circles on circles on circles, which works great, gives you lots of more tools, but things are getting really complicated now, and they're not very elegant. If the heavens are supposed to be perfect and elegant, they're circles, but it's not very elegant. And so he says, you know what, if you put the sun in the center, everything becomes a lot easier. And I'll show you how this works. Remember, trying to explain how retrograde motion goes, but also how to predict the motion of the planets. Now, here's the thing, and we're, no one's really sure about this, what was going on, but Copernicus, in, the inter, in his sort of introduction to his book, which he had published posthumously, he says this is just a calculation device. He says, I have found a clever, he's a mathematician, he says, I found a clever way to make it easier to figure out where the planets are. And he doesn't really say, this is what I think the universe looks like. He's just saying, Calculation, because he's essentially overthrowing the dominant paradigm that has been in existence in the West to that point, the Aristotelian paradigm that the heavens are perfect and that things are moving in certain ways and the earth is at the center. So he's going to move the sun to the center, the earth out to the third uh, rank, solves a bunch of other problems, put the moon in orbit around the earth, and then Mars and Jupiter and Saturn are outside us. Now, what happens with retrograde, and you can see this here, um, position A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you can draw a straight line. Here's Earth and Mars at position A. You can see it appears, ah, there. It appears to be there on the sky. B, it appears to be there. C, it appears to be there. D, and you get this loop-to-loop -loop action, and essentially the loop-to-loop -loop happens when the inner planet, which is moving more rapidly, passes the outer planet. When I was teaching, I used to describe this to my students and say, do you know, when you have two cars going down the road and one car is in the fast lane and one car is in the slow lane, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, um, and the person in the fast lane is going along at a pretty good clip, you look in the distance and you see the cars moving with you, and then the car that's going faster starts to pull up alongside, and all of a sudden it looks like the car you're passing is sort of going backwards. And then as you get farther, it starts to keep up with you again. So you, you have that sense of the car moving forward, and as you pass it, it goes backwards, and then it goes forward again. It's essentially what's happening in the sky. It's retrograde motion. So now we have two models for describing what we're seeing, this retrograde motion. We have the Ptolemaic model, which is based in this Aristotelian idea that things have to be perfect in the sky, therefore we have to have circles, and the Earth is at the center. And we have the Copernican idea, which is much simpler to calculate. And, yeah, and it's easier in some ways to understand how it works, but it's not what we used to think. Do you ever hear the guy, uh, uh, William of Occam, Occam's Razor? Do you remember Occam's Razor? Multiplicity ought not be posited without necessity. 
It's much more impressive in Latin. Uh, but the idea is of Occam's razor is the simplest explanation is the best. Are there any doctors in the house? Okay, when you were learning to do diagnosis, do you remember hearing someone say, if you see hoof prints in Central Park, think horses, not zebras? That's Occam's razor. That's because the simpler answer, if you're seeing hoof prints, is it's a horse and not a zebra. If you're going to see a zebra, you know, how did the zebra get there? What's the zebra doing in, in Central Park? And you, know, you have to get a much more complicated structure. And Occam's idea is the simpler answer is preferred over the more complicated. Uh, Sherlock Holmes does that all through the crime novels. We kind of know this instinctively. And so you have two competing claims. You have the, the circular motion and the epicycles, and you have the, earth at the, the sun at the center, and you have the Copernican idea. You know what? Mathematically, Ptolemy's ideas work better. That you, you get actually more accurate predictions with Ptolemy's idea than you do with Copernicus. It, Kepler comes along, he fixes it because he adjusts the circle into an ellipse, and that gives you another thing you can adjust to make it all work. But Ptolemy works better because you've got more things to adjust. Um, well, I don't want to go into Fourier analysis, but those of you who are scientifically trained, it's essentially Fourier's theorem, right? If you have enough parameters you can adjust, you can absolutely approximate any waveform. Um, right? Ask me about that at coffee hour. Um, so Galileo comes in, and this is when things get interesting. Galileo comes in, and it's Galileo who, above all, invents modern scientific philosophy. He argues that the only thing that mattered was what was real. What does that mean? The thing that I could actually observe and reproduce. The thing that I could observe and reproduce, that's what matters. The theory, the idea, the philosophical structure, the beauty of an idea, doesn't matter at all. What matters is what I can observe. This brings him into conflict. Galileo begins to teach Copernicus's theory. He was asked to stop. Now, there's this really sort of bad history of science that has Galileo as a hero of scientific thought. And, you know, the bad church comes along and says, stupid Galileo, you shut up. But yet it moves. You know, he has to recant. And then there's this idea of him in the dungeon, you know, with the Inquisition. He's chained up and he says, I will submit to you after torture. But still, it moves. Meaning the earth moves and it's not stationary. Yeah. You know, first of all, the Pope at the time was a dear friend of Galileo's. And the Pope had been very close to Galileo and had defended him earlier. Uh, when Galileo was imprisoned, he was imprisoned in the second floor of a palace. He wasn't allowed on the first floor of a palace, just the second floor. That was a very humane way. And he was forbidden at the end from continuing to work on planetary motion. And so he spent most of the rest of his life sort of doing physics. And it was his physics ideas that Newton used and expanded on to sort of write the Principia. Why was he asked to stop? If you actually read the Pope's criticism of Galileo's work, the Pope wasn't bothered by what was a simple calculation, essentially, a methodology for calculating things. And people weren't all that... Uh, Greek philosophers had had the idea that the, the sun was at the center. There were Greek uh, astronomers and Alexander who even had figured out that the Earth was a sphere because you can see the round shape of the sphere on a lunar eclipse. You can see the shadow of the Earth moving across the moon. It's, it's round. He kind of figured that out right there. Um, they had figured out how far it was from the sun to the Earth because they're ways you can see the sun shining straight down in a well in Alexandria and in another place and you can work out the triangle and, and they got a pretty good number for that. That wasn't the issue. The issue was Galileo was critiquing the idea of how do we decide what was true and saying there was only one way to say it was true and it had to be testable. It had to be reproducible at will and testable. You can see why religion might have a problem with this? The resurrection of our Lord is not something that we can test that same way, right? Karl Popper would just say, oh, that's just not part of science. That's a, that's a different sort of value set, a different way, uh, not value set, a different intellectual exercise than what we're doing in scientific work. And so the two sort of, that's over there and this is over here. 
It's kind of like you have an island of truth here and an island of truth over there. And you have to send boats between them because they don't necessarily connect with each other. The real issue the Pope was critiquing was how do we decide what is true? And, and that's a legitimate beef. And, and Galileo didn't take that criticism very well. He wrote a book. He has the Pope's uh, views expressed by... He has one of these threefold conversations and he names the person who gives the Pope's arguments stupid or simplico, which basically means the fool. And you, you don't do that to a medieval Pope. <laughs> Um, so uh, Galileo got in trouble but that's the argument of Galileo is actually really instructive for us so what is truth Uh, that's kind of the key question isn't it we have scientific truth and we have religious truth and and what is truth it would be really great if Jesus had answered that question (laughs) do you know remember in in the the stories of uh, Holy Week that Jesus is brought before Pilate and Pilate asks Jesus specifically, I think it's in John's Gospel, right? Um, Jesus is asked by Pilate, what is truth? And Jesus does not respond. For the preacher, that's kind of a wonderful, uh, heavily symbolic, you know, asking about what is truth and there is, for us who are Christians, the truth standing right in front of him. But it would have been really nice if Jesus could have taken a moment and just answered that question because it would save us all a lot of effort. But it's also interesting that Jesus doesn't. Um, I was on a radio show once with a rabbi. Um, and the rabbi and I were, we were both trained scientifically, we were both trained theologically. And we were talking about science and religion. And the rabbi said, God hides things from us. That God expects us to use our brains to figure things out. Why God does that, I'm not sure, but God does that. And asking God what is the truth and hearing silence is in perfect keeping with that idea. And I think there's something to that. Um, It would be really great if all the answers to all of our questions were on giant gold letters, like in Star Wars, out in the solar system somewhere, and we could just look at them and read them. But they're not, are they? Uh, For those of us who are religious, we are being asked to use our brains to uh, wrestle with these questions. Kind of a neat thing. Do you you remember what Israel means? When when he who struggles with God, right? When you are part of the tribe of Israel, you are the people who are struggling with God. So how do we know what is true? I mean, that's the big question. In science, the lab... Reality is the only determinant of truth. What we can reproduce and do. Um, oh, darn, I can't remember the Latin. Uh, the motto of the Royal um, Scientific Society in England was with our own eyes only. So people could make claims, but until the scientists of the Royal Society could actually duplicate the experiment in their presence, it didn't count as science. And, and that was a huge shift. You wouldn't just take a report, that, oh, there are giant dragons in the South Pacific. You have to see the dragon before it becomes scientifically real. In religion, it's a bit more complicated. What is true? It takes time. You can't just have a definitive answer in a moment. If you want to accept my idea that religion determines what is true by what is able to be received by the body of faithful or what it is that is able to endure challenge, then it's going to take generations, centuries, millennia to be able to work out what's true. And it means you're going to, as a number of theologians have said, including uh, Rowan Williams, you're going to have to hold your truths lightly because you're going to have to recognize the fact that we're not sure we've got this nailed down yet. Well, that brings up a whole other question. Is reality real? If you're scientific. Is is reality real? Is is it reliable? Uh, Bishop Barclay, one of my favorites. They named my seminary after him. Bishop Barclay was an Anglican bishop. And they... He's well known for sort of asking questions. How do we know we're not just dreaming? Uh, Am I a butterfly dreaming of being a man? How do I know the reality... uh, uh, What's that movie... Uh, Matrix, right? The Matrix, where we're all just battery cells for a bunch of robots. Uh, and we, what we think is reality is kind of a shared illusion that we all have. There's actually a lot of deep theology 
to that as well. And, and the idea that we are dreaming something together with God is another way. Is reality real? Is it reliable? Well, here, let me just point out what science says about this, since we're saying that science says whatever is real is what matters. Relativity, Einstein's theory of relativity, which has survived every single experimental test, and a few just recently that were toward the force test, says, so it's, at least scientifically it says it's true, relativity requires that we give up the idea of a universal reference frame. There is no universal reference frame. There is no universal here or there. I cannot say, that's why, remember I said, Einstein said you can claim you're at the center of the universe. Forget about whether or not it's the Earth at the center of the universe, or the Sun at the center of the universe, or the center of the galactic uh, Milky Way galaxy, or the center of the uh, Great Magellanic Crown, whatever. Nope, I, I declare myself to be the center of the universe, not narcissistically speaking, and I am I'm telling the truth. And no one can controvert me. And, and Father Tierney can stand up and say, no, I beg to differ, Bishop. I am the center of the universe. <laughs> and he can absolutely say that, and you can't controvert him. And any, you can go to Mars, and you can say, no, we're the center of the universe. You can go to Alpha Centauri and say, we're the center of the universe. And it all works. It all works perfectly. There's no absolute reference frame anymore. There's no up, there's no down, there's no left, there's no right. It just depends where you are. It drives people nuts. It, it really does. Nobody liked it. Um, Einstein came to not be particularly proud of it uh, towards the end of his life, and he was constantly working to sort of figure out a way around it. But it means there's no sort of fundamental measure to reality. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says, uh, well, it follows necessarily. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, uh, what's the joke I heard the other day? Uh, Heisenberg is driving down the road and a policeman pulls him over and said, Professor Heisenberg, did you know you're going 103 miles an hour? And Heisenberg goes, oh, nuts. Now I don't know where I am. Because <laughs> you can know where you are or you can know how fast you're moving, but you can't know both. <laughs> so the moment they told him how fast he's moving, now he doesn't know where he is anymore. Um, that principle and, and the location and momentum uh, uh, and energy and time and there, there are other conjugal variables in uh, uh, quantum physics. The principle follows directly if you say that na- that matter has a wave nature. Well, that makes things even more complex. So, if matter has a wave nature, if I have a wavelength, and uh, Count de Broglie says I do. Uh, de Bois, if you like French, but de Broglie is how I always said. He was a physicist. He was a nobleman who turned physicist to impress everyone. And he took something that uh, Schrodinger had written and said, what if, about photons, and said, what if it worked for matter? It turns out matter has a wavelength. So where are you? If you're declaring yourself center, okay, fine. Where's the center of you? Ah, well, that's a, I'm kind of a schmear. <laughs> I'm kind of in here, sort of, except I can't really know that. And so we become spread out where there's no absolute in this. We cannot be certain about what is happening. According to relativity, there are no absolutes. According to quantum physics, there are no absolutes. So what's real? What's absolutely real? The best scientific models we have say you can't know that absolutely. You can know it roughly, but you can't know it to any kind of what we pretend is scientific precision. It's just impossible. No one's real happy about this. They really aren't. Scientists are not excited about this, but it's just the case. Uh, Feynman was the one who said, get over it already. The world just is different than you think it is. Feynman's probably right. So can Galileo be right about truth? The truth is the thing that is universally testable and is reliable and always the same. No, he can't. It's impossible if general relativity, if relativity, special relativity, or general relativity is true, and if Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is true. It's just, it's not possible. You can be good enough testable, but you can't be absolutely testable. Um, is something true only if it can be proven true? That's my favorite thing in all the world, is Gödel's theorem. Gödel's theorem is, uh, it's a rigorous proof. It was done in the beginning of the 20th century. And Gödel was able to show that logic will not get you everywhere to truth. 
So there are things that are true that cannot be proven to be true. There are things that are true that cannot be proven to be true. Logic has its limits. It, it's a weird sort of mathematical proof. It's, it's not unlike being able to prove that a number is irrational. Do you remember doing those when you were learning about number theory in high school? And you, the real way to prove a number is irrational is figure out all the decimal places and say it never repeats. But you have to do that to infinity and it's impossible to do. So you find another way to prove it. And you can prove it never repeats even though you don't know what the number really actually is. Well, you can do that with Gödel's theorem. You can prove that logic has its limits. What Gödel's theorem sort of suggests is, like I was saying, there are these islands of truth. There's an island here and an island here and an island there. And it may or may not be possible to move from island to island. Uh, regions of truthiness, to borrow a phrase from Colbert. <laughs> so there's truthiness regions here and truthiness regions there. And, and that's just the way the universe is. I don't particularly like it. I think it'd be great if logic, crystalline pure logic, would get me everywhere. But it doesn't. And, and I don't seem to be able to... I, I, I'll talk to God about this, assuming I get the chance. And it may be sort of... I may have as much effect as Pilate did in getting an answer. I may just get silence back. And that God says, you need to use your own brain to figure this out. So an ideological su survival of the fittest idea might be worth studying in science. The way I was talking about how truth is determined in religion, maybe that's going to have something to do with how we end up doing truth in science. Occam's razor and Galileo and the scientific method becomes complicated. I, I really want to give credit where credit it's uh, Pope Benedict XVI wrote in a paper of his, it was just an offhanded comment about post positivism. And I'd never heard the word before, and I, I got really interested in it. And I looked it up. Post positivism is the idea that there is absolute truth, but you can never completely and totally get there. You can asthmatically, if you remember that from uh, hyperbolas and things like that, you can asthmatically approach the truth but you can't actually jump the boundary into the region of absolute truth. So it's there, but we can't quite get there. And maybe that's just the way the universe works. It's called post positivism um, And a lot of people are ending up there. Popper uh, is a post positive He's one of the leaders of the school. Uh, and it's worth looking up if you're not familiar with it. So I, I kind of get this idea of celebrity paradigm deathmatch. I wrote this lecture notes up a long time ago and that was an ongoing thing on Saturday Night Live and my students loved it. It's not as funny now, I guess, but um, the idea that you have these paradigms and they're just going to have to compete with one another and we'll see which one survives. Uh, I, I would love to tell you there is no conflict between science and religion at all, but I'm afraid there is and it's because of the way they deal with what they know about the world. They have different methods right now of finding the truth. So what can they do together? Well, truth is truth. We may not be able to get there, but it's still there. Truth is truth. And if we find a scientific truth, religion is going to have to deal with it. And, that's just, and I'm echoing St. Augustine of Hippo when I say that. St. Augustine of Hippo wrote in response to a controversy about Genesis in his own day, where various natural philosophers were saying, look, the Bible is saying things that we just know aren't true. It was talking about the flood and where all the waters came from and where all the waters went. And the philosopher said, this makes no logical sense. And early Christians were trying to decide, no, the Bible is absolutely true. We're going to have to invent this very complicated structure to explain where the waters were and they drained and where they went to. And Augustine finally said, look, and I'm paraphrasing him, but the, the general idea is, if you as a Christian are going to say to someone who knows something about a subject that the Bible contradicts him and he has to give up what he knows is true, he's not going to be able to hear the Bible when you're saying the Bible is saying something that really matters. So if the Bible says the way we read it that the earth is, is, was created in seven days and we know that's not true scientifically, religion is going to have to deal with the fact that that's probably poetic. Not probably, most likely, you know, it's poetic. Um, you know, and, and frankly, the majority of Christians in the world see it that way. 
that's, the, that's what the Roman Catholic Church understands, and their numbers are so large that they kind of swamp the rest of us. That's what the Greek Orthodox Church believes, what the Anglican Church believes, it's what the Lutheran Church believes, and there you have the four largest denominations. Um, so most Christians actually sort of are in that camp, that this is a poetic bit of language. It's not supposed to be understood literally. There are other Christians who do, and it becomes very difficult to talk to them, but you have to deal with the fact that truth is truth. So when you find a truth, that's going to uh, force us to think about things like morality and ethics. I think religion has something to say to science. It is one of the things that really bothered me at the end of my scientific work, the cavalier way that scientists could intellectually dismiss the suffering of people in kind of a utilitarian logic. Well, it's a, if maybe we have to break a few eggs. Maybe a few million people have to die while we work out how to feed the other billion. And I, was, I remember being shocked when I heard someone say that in all seriousness, that and maybe wars were important for population control. And we shouldn't stop wars. We should allow wars to go on. Well, that's logical, but it's, it, it's immoral. And I, I, I simply could, I couldn't stand still in that presence. And I think religion has something to say about the sacredness of life and how important human beings are because we're made in the image of God. And that needs to inform scientific thought about what how do we make biological decisions? How do we decide what we're going to study and test? It informs ethics. Teleology is the idea that uh, the ultimate meaning. You know, what, what's the end of, what's the purpose for which I was created? What's the purpose of the universe? And teleology is something I think science and religion can talk about uh, to each other. Because science is starting to wonder about this. Why are we here? What was the purpose for which we were created? How did we get to be here? And religion, that's specifically what it speaks to. Um, in a sense, that's worldview and meaning. right? Religion is starting to think about what does it mean? You know, think about how. What does it mean? You know, it, as I was talking to my sister-in-law the other day and we were talking about some of these ideas and she pointed out to me that truth is a great idea but because it's so difficult to ascertain in an absolute way maybe we have to give up this desire to get to truth and we have to sort of instead focus on meaning because meaning is what's important to us individually meaning is what makes our narratives work meaning is what gives us a purpose in life a worldview. How do we create meaning out of the information we have in our life? And that's, I think, something science can talk about, the meaning, and I think that's something religion has to add to that. Instead of worrying about what's true, what's meaningful? What's meaningful to us? You know, we're still not sure if we're butterflies dreaming of being a man. Um, in terms of truth, you can't really ever tell. But in terms of meaning, it doesn't really matter. It still hurts if I stub my toe it still hurts if I see another person crying. And, and so I, that's, that meaning becomes what I have to deal with. Uh, and not just sort of, oh, what's Aristophanes, Cloud Cuckoo Land, and all that sort of stuff. It's one of the first critiques of that. The last thing I want to say, and I think this is really important, is God did not create God's children to be in ghettos. And by a ghetto, I mean the old-fashioned language. A ghetto is a place where people are segregated. You know, they used to have the Islamic quarter, the Jewish quarter, uh, the, the Byzantine quarter in cities, especially in the Middle East. They were ghettos. You were forcibly put in those ghettos and you were not allowed out of them. Sometimes people go willingly into ghettos. Sometimes people are forced into ghettos. Uh, there's a lot of shameful history in our own country, in Europe, about all of this. The Bible is clear. God did not create us to keep ourselves apart from one another. You know, what does Deuteronomy worry about? The Deuteronomist says the big things that God cares about are the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner. Your relationship to other people is what God really cares about. And how you treat the powerless, how you treat the people who are different than you, God cares about that. As a religious leader, as a religious person, I tell you, that we are not to be keeping ourselves apart. And therefore, I want to argue that ghettos are wrong for 
ideas as well. And this is what worries me right now, that we are falling into the habit in American society of creating these thought ghettos. Um, I was once nominated to be the, the bishop in Kentucky, which thankfully I lost. They have a wonderful bishop, and I got to come to Rhode Island, where I'm the luckiest and happiest bishop in the church. Really, yeah, I love this state. You all are so amazing. Um, but in Kentucky, they have the creation, creation land or whatever. And it's a place where you can go and learn about the biblical teaching. And, you know, they have children riding on dinosaurs in their caveman outfits and everything. And, and it's kind of a place where you, the regular scientific world is not allowed. And you create your own sort of little thought region where you're not challenged by things. And that's a great place to live. Uh, it's very comfortable, but it's not what God intended. That's the religious ghetto. Scientific ghettos exist as well. And there are people who are absolute rationalists who will not even talk about purpose or meaning. And, and you know, the Dadaists, the you know, the, uh, you just end up with this thing. And it, it's, it's a horrible way to live. And no one wants to live that way. You, there really has to be this conversation constantly. And not just between science and religion, but science, religion, and art. Uh, there's so many wonderful ideas floating around. I think it's so important that we create places for them to have that conversation. I, I'd like to think that happens naturally in churches, uh, but it happens in universities, it happens in coffee houses, it happens wherever people are playing with ideas with one another. And that, to me, is the most hopeful thing that's going on. But if you would just take this idea away with you tonight, God did not create us to live our lives in intellectual ghettos. You have to play with both sets of ideas. Einstein played with religion. He talked about Spinoza and Spinoza's God, the God of natural expression that he found so fascinating and spent so much of his life seeking. Uh, lots of religious people, so many of the early scientists, the great scientists, even in the beginning of the 20th century, are clergy people. Uh, who studied science as a way to understand something about God. It's only later on that we begin to think science and religion can't talk to each other. They have trouble talking to each other. They're using different language structures, but they have to talk to one another or else we're going to get ourselves in a lot of trouble. So with that, the sermon ends. <laughs>